Hello everybody, so today's video is going to be a little bit of a different one and I'm actually going to be reading out my EPQ dissertation type piece thing. Um, if you don't know what an EPQ is, it stands for Extended Project Qualification and it's just something extra that you can do um, just to kind of, like to be honest with you, I don't really know, you can just research it. Um, I, I'm going to be completely honest, I wasn't really that bothered about my EPQ, I didn't really put much effort into it and I don't know, I, I did a little bit to start with, but I've had two years to do it. Anyway, let's quit the rambling. This is kind of a little disclaimer. My piece that I finished doing is not really a dissertation because it's actually based on selective mutism, which is something that I suffered from myself. And I wanted to be able to talk about my own experiences whilst also talking about the research that I've done. So it's kind of like a case study on myself or like a profile or something like it's not really a dissertation but it is about 5,000 words so you know it's quite the length so I thought in today's video I'd actually just read it out to you I when I printed this off I noticed there was a grammar error within the first sentence so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to correct that grammar error and if I spot any other er errors I will just correct it without even like mentioning it um, but yeah, it might take me some time, but I have researched all of this. So all of this is based on research. Well, half of it's based on research that I've done and the other half is based on kind of my experiences and my story. I put a lot of research into this. If there's any facts that you know, <clears throat> sorry, my voice has gone. <clears throat> filmed another video before this one um, but if there's any facts that you think are wrong or anything like that then this is purely down to my research so you can obviously correct me in the comments but let's begin so this is my dissertation type thing um yeah and it kind of starts off almost a little bit like a story so you, you'll see what I'm on about but it's not a story Spending the whole of your childhood afraid and anxious, crying most nights and dreading any social event isn't something that you look back on with joy. Selective mutism takes away a massive proportion of your life that you will never get back again. It is defined as an anxiety disorder in which a person who is normally capable of speech does not speak in specific situations or to specific people. There is no choice of whether you speak or not. Physically feeling unable to talk despite trying your hardest to combat the monster inside of your head telling you that you're going to say something wrong or that people would judge you. Being trapped behind a barrier of anxiety, feeling judged and laughed at as you sit there uncomfortably and uncontrollably laughing because that was the only way you can express a response to a situation. Laughing as a response is uncontrollable and it's what often gets sufferers of the condition into a lot of trouble. That is why teachers, parents and carers need to be aware of this condition and how to deal with it. Selective mutism, SM, typically affects children beginning school at any key stages of their school life and in most situations they would normally recover after a few months. Unfortunately, a lot of sufferers have to live with SM for a large proportion of their life. It takes over your life and strongly affects the way that you learn and how well you do in school as it's difficult to interact and involve yourself in any situation. The fact that sufferers are usually between the ages of two and six expresses how awareness needs to be spread. All these children are just labelled as shy or not obedient. Adults can suffer from this as well and it's statistically more common in girls than boys, with the majority of cases leading to social phobias and anxiety disorders in later life. The majority of children suffering from SM cry in social situations or cling to a parent, whereas others giggle or nod in acknowledgement. This is because they want to respond but feel unable to and the only way of showing some form of a response is to smile or giggle. This is because they want to respond but feel unable to and the only way of showing some form of a response is to smile or giggle because speaking out words seems impossible. If this behaviour is seen regularly, then it is clear sign that there is some form of anxiety present and it needs to be recognised by parents or carers so that help can be provided. A lot of people say the reason why they don't communicate is because they hate the sound of their own voice and have a fear of saying things wrong, believing that others will judge them for it. A fear of your own voice is very common in a lot of anxiety sufferers and it makes them feel like, um, feel like they stand out from the rest or that their voice sounds different or weird to others. This leaves them unable to communicate through the fear of being judged on the way that they speak. In the, 198, in the 1870s, it was thought that the child could control the ability to talk and it was named aphasia voluntaria. I might pronounce that wrong, kids. <laughs> 
It was then renamed to elective mutism in the early 1930s, suggesting that it was a voluntary decision to not talk, but it certainly isn't. It was named this due to the lack of understanding at the time, but further research did lead to it being retitled again to selective mutism by the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Health Disorders. This new definition is the current one and it describes that there is no choice in speaking as it is a mental health problem. The key to understanding the condition is to realise that it's not a decision made by the child to, to not talk and it's definitely something that shouldn't be punished. Punishments for not talking is something very common in schools and makes the condition worse because the child views the situation as uncomfortable or traumatic and doesn't want to talk again. The classroom at school is a place where the signs and symptoms of SM are mainly seen, but it can often be mistaken for shyness, meaning that these children don't get the help they require to recover. Some teachers believe that the symptoms are just a phase and at such a young age this has a huge negative impact towards a child's learning ability and their quality of life because they're unable to involve themselves into situations and can often not make friends. Despite having SM, some still make friends with people that they will then latch onto and rely on in most social situations and this means that they're unable to work independently and feel reliant on someone else. This is something that teachers must be aware of. Children with this condition need help not singling out from the rest. Picking on them in class and forcing them to participate is not help as it makes a child feel even more anxious having experienced such a trauma and it means that they don't want to experience situations like that again. Situations like meeting friends, family parties and going to school don't seem like a trauma to some people but to sufferers it's situations like this that make them worry the most. The feeling of worry that you're going to be forced into participating in class, answering the register and even sitting alone every break and lunch is what leaves some children with depression that they often have to combat alone. Depression is, com is common within selective mutism sufferers because they feel it singled out from the rest of the world and the everyday worry about social situations and the future often feels like too much for them to deal with. They sometimes cannot see a future without having this huge fear every day and can lead to them and can lead them to severe depression. There have been certain cases of people wanting to commit suicide from suffering from the condition because they believe it's their only option to be free from the world of being trapped in your own mind, unable to get out. They believe that there is no road to recovery and they'll always feel anxious and frightened to talk. Teachers think they're helping when they try and involve an SM sufferer in class, but in actual fact, they're making things so much worse. So an understanding of how to help must be grasped or children will grow up still suffering from the condition or having memories of the traumatic situations that they've been put in. The only way a child can overcome this condition is to develop confidence within themselves and to push themselves into situations. When someone else is trying to push them into uncomfortable situations, they have a feeling of being overpowered and forced and this can only worsen the condition. Routine is something an SM sufferer relies on to make them feel better. If something happens that hadn't been planned for in their schedule, it can leave them feeling very sad and unhappy with a million thoughts running through their head trying to justify why this change has occurred. This leads to children feeling confused as to why this they feel this way and it leaves them crying alone and feeling unable to share what they're going through with anyone else. Routine is something that is an escape route for them because it's what they're comfortable with and anything out of the ordinary will confuse and panic them. Something as simple as the weather changing from winter to summer, a different time of, for lunch than expected, a random family activity that's just sprung, sprung on you makes... Um, just sprung on them makes them feel disorganised, unmotivated and incredibly anxious. The sudden unplanned change in the daily routine makes a sudden bout of panic and fear of the unknown and they're suddenly not in their comfort zone. There are hundreds of things that can cause selective mutism and many of them are linked together. One of the first theories is called the psychodynamic theory which means unsolved conflict. This means anything from keeping a family secret, not having a healthy relationship with your family members or friends, or displaying huge amounts of anger towards parents for unknown reasons. This condition is viewed as a coping mechanism for dealing with anger and anxieties, and anger towards parents is seen as a punishment to them. Another reason is traumatic events that takes place in someone's life, like being attacked by a dog, and SM can be linked to having a fear of dogs despite not ever being attacked by one. One case of a dog attack was when a four-year-old was bitten by a dog and admitted to the University Hospital of Crete in Greece. This traumatic event triggered SM and acute post-traumatic stress disorder, whilst also having major outbursts of anger and struggling to concentrate on everyday t uh, tasks. 
Rape, molestation, incest and physical or emotional abuse is another form of trauma that can cause a child or adult to suffer from SM due to the fact that in most cases they have to deal with this trauma alone, feeling unable to talk to anyone for help. This leads sufferers to struggle to cope with what they're having to deal with and leads them to suffer from SM. Some researchers believe that strict or overprotective parents can have huge implications on a child's behaviour, making them feel small and insignificant and lead them unable to talk in social situations. Unfortunately, this is where parents need to understand the condition and they need to know how to treat it. Despite there being case causes to the condition, it can actually be hereditary. Parents of SM sufferers sometimes explain how they felt as a child and their thought process was the same as what their child has explained. So it is certainly something that can be passed down through generations. This gives parents that have experienced this themselves the opportunity to be prepared for their own child and they, might, and they may have the experience to try and help them. Although it can often be hereditary, there are still external factors which will worsen the condition through situations that they're forced into. It's not always something that is passed down through generations as it all depends on the alleles that are within their genes. Obsessive compulsive disorders, depression and Asperger's syndrome are all linked to selective mutism and they all have similar symptoms which often make diagnosis of one of the conditions very difficult because it can be hard to differentiate between them in certain cases. 7.4% of children that suffer from selective mutism meet the criteria for Asperger's. Obsessive compulsive disorder can develop from SM because it's a way for the individual to control something and it makes them feel better believing that they're in control. Organising things, having a daily routine and keeping to a strict schedule are all things that make the child feel in control and help them to cope with everyday occurrences. This is how OCD can become something that develops as a coping mechanism for having such severe anxiety and inevitably can also lead to depression. They feel depressed because they can't complete normal life activities like others and can feel as if they will never be able to. This is something that can be a massive worry to the sufferer themselves but also to the family me members and parents of the sufferer because their future lies with the confidence um, that they have. It was once believed that SM only developed due to an inability to speak or a stutter that makes it difficult to speak, when in actual fact it is the social inability to not be able to talk. SM can develop from many, from many different causes and in some cases they come about um, through having strict parents, abuse and a fear of talking due to believing that they'll be shouted or disciplined. This is consistent with the theory that people with SM avoid talking because they have a fear of being teased for mispronouncing a word. This is called pre pre-morbid speech language disability. Difficulty in hearing, particularly in children, can lead to people thinking that the child suffers from selective mutism because they do not respond. Likewise, SM can often be believed to be a hearing impediment to begin with because the child does not show signs of talking, making it believed that they don't understand what's being asked or they cannot hear. In actual fact, the child wants to respond but feels physically unable to due to the severe worry of being judged Speech inability is also something that can be confused with SM because some children are unable to pronounce or say certain words which means they do not talk and can lead them to believe that they have a social phobia of talking. This would quickly be identified by a speech language pathologist and would be diagnosed as a speech inability rather than a social anxiety. Children may be struggling in lessons in school but feel unable to ask for help so they remain in silence. This causes developmental delays and it affects their mental health even more due to the stresses of school and the worry for their future. This is also a worry for parents because they want to help their child and they want to have the confidence in knowing that their child will have a successful future. Unfortunately, SM can make that very difficult. Going to the shops, answering the door and getting the bus seem like impossible tasks for a selective mute, let alone having an interview for a job. Recovering from this condition is not easy and can often take years for someone to fully recover, but with the help of a professional and having a supporting family can lead to a full recovery. Unfortunately, in most cases, there are still certain anxiety disorders that remain even after recovering from SM, and for some people, this never goes away. Learning how to deal with it will aid them to recovery, but having professional help will reduce the time it takes to get to recovery. Treating the disorder is easier said than done because everyone is different and the condition affects them to different degrees. To begin with, teachers and parents need to be heavily informed about different mental health conditions so that they can at least identify that their child has some form of a mental health disorder and they can go on to help them. The way in which they should go about helping needs to be told to teachers because a lot of the time adults believe that they're aiding the sufferer when actually they're making it a lot worse. When getting professional help with a doctor, the doctor needs to know whether the child is actually attempting to talk in certain situations situations but feel as if they can't. 
If this isn't the case, then they're not sufferers of SM and another potential disorder needs to be considered so that they can get the correct treatment for the condition that they have. There are different types of health professionals that can help, for example, audiologists, audio, audiologists, psychiatrists and speech language pathologists. They will be able to help families um, sorry, they will be able to help tell families what to do and give advice on diagnosing the conditions. They will look into the sufferer's family history to see if there was anyone else that suffered from SM or a social phobia of any kind to see if the disorder could be hereditary. Deeper investigation into past trauma will identify potential causes of the condition and therapists can help to aid the selected mute into recovery. If a trauma has caused someone to suffer from the condition, then the pathway to recovery is incredibly difficult because not only does the sufferer have to overcome the condition of SM, but they have to deal and live with the traumatic event that they have been through. I suffered from selective mutism myself from the age of three and it's affected my life dramatically. My earliest memories are vague, but consistent with the fact that I never spoke the whole time I was at nursery. It's like watching a movie where you see what is happening, but you're unable to interact or respond, feeling trapped behind a barrier of anxiety with no help or understanding from anyone. The lack of knowledge about the conditions shines through with the fact that my nursery supervisor would tell me off and shout at me on many occasions for reasons that I'm still not yet sure of. This has to change because children, children are left feeling confused, alone and scared of going back to school due to chip due to teachers not understanding the condition and leads them not wanting to speak because they feel as if they're going to be told off. Going up to year two, um, Going up to year two and three was still very difficult and at the time I wondered why everyone else seemed so confident and why they were able to make friends so quickly, whereas I struggled massively to make friends. Some children of this age spend every break and lunch on their own with only their own company and this makes the condition worse. Having friendship builds confidence and makes the sufferers have someone to effectively copy from, meaning that their confidence lifts gradually over time. Other children are often so young and they lack the understanding of mental health conditions and unfortunately this leads them to bullying children that suffer from mental health conditions because sufferers are seen as outsiders from everybody else and easy to pick on. Also at this point in time my mum had realised that there was something wrong with me and she would come into school to play a board game with me and my friends so that they could see how I interacted with other children. Because my mum was there, I felt comfortable and safe because I knew that she could speak for me. However, when she left the room, there was a sudden wave of fear and, unsa and unsafety as I realised I was alone and I had to talk for myself. These kind of activities are things that are organised so that the parents can see how the child is behaving at school and how they interact with other pupils. Unfortunately, this is not an accurate representation of how a selective mute behaves through the day because it doesn't show how they behave when spoken to in lessons and how they are at break times. Parents and teachers are also unable to see what the sufferer is thinking and how they're feeling because they may look like they're fine when in actual fact they're battling with their own mind in a field of fear and often depression. School days weren't a joy for me and being at home wasn't either. I still struggled with my lack of confidence in family situations and everyday occurrences were incredibly difficult and this meant that every day was spent in fear of what would happen the next. Going to the shops, meeting family members or even friends was something I feared tremendously. A level of anger had developed inside of me and it meant that I would become irrationally angry at certain things and people. This is because children who suffer from selective mutism have no way of escape from the ongoing battle in their mind. So when they get home from being silent all day at school, there is this outburst of energy in the form of anger. They're upset and struggling. They don't understand why it's only them that feel this way. They want to let out how they're feeling without actually saying what's wrong. Unfortunately, this is how children can end up being told off and disciplined for the anger that they show, making them want to rebel even more whilst developing a hatred for the world that surrounds them. The changing point for me was when I moved up to secondary school. It was a chance for a new start. Not many people knew me at school, meaning that I felt as if I could create this new persona for myself that was more confident and chatty. People didn't know the shy me and they wouldn't be surprised if I suddenly built up the confidence to start talking. This tells me that selective mutism is a condition that is based on worrying about what people you know well think about you. Seeing family members and friends and family, seeing family members and family friends was always so much more difficult than meeting new people that had no significance to my life. And this is because they didn't know me and couldn't, and I could pretend to be a different person if I wanted. I didn't have to worry about being judged because I'd never see them again. This is the building blocks to recovery. As I grew older, I started to realise that creating a new character for myself has enabled me to be more confident because I could pretend that I was confident. This pretense was difficult 
because deep down I still felt incredibly anxious and worried about the situation. But as, as time went on, I began to get used to the new me and the people around me got to know me like this as well. So it meant that the anxious feeling started to go away and I slowly managed to recover from SM. It is something that takes a long time to overcome and even now I still suffer from anxiety in certain situations. I don't believe it will ever go away, but I do know that it can be controlled. I didn't have professional help and I had to deal with this on my own and I believe this was the best way for me because it meant that I was in control of my own thoughts and everything I did was under my terms. This is very important for someone suffering from SM because anxiety comes about through people feeling like they have no control over a situation and recovery will only happen if they force themselves to do things rather than someone else making them. The feeling of someone else overpowering you or telling you what you should do makes you feel a huge amount of pressure and makes you want to walk away from the situation. Another turning point that aided me to my recovery was starting my YouTube channel a couple of years ago. It is a place for me to chat and talk about things I love but under my own terms, allowing me to feel in control of what I say because I can edit out anything I'm unhappy with. It means I don't have to worry about what I say because I can go back and take stuff out and edit things in. When I was a child, I felt uncomfortable with the sound of my own voice and I hated it. But since making YouTube videos, I've learned to love my own voice and accept that it is normal because I hear it so often. The comments that I get on my videos make me feel happy because everyone's always so positive and uplifting most of the time. And it makes me realize that the majority of people in society are not judging you in a negative way. All of my friends and family watched my videos and saw how confident I was in those videos and it inspired me to be just as confident in real life. Because they'd seen me being confident in a video, it meant that it would not be a shock if I was acting like this in real life. This was the main thing that developed my confidence and I'm so glad I started my channel. It brought out my creativity and enabled me to show my true personality. I've created several videos based on the topic of selective mutism and they are not and they are my most viewed. Uh, my most viewed videos and show that I'm not alone. One of the videos has over 350 comments of people talking in length about their stories too, demonstrating that there are a lot of people out there of varying ages suffering from this condition and requiring help. Despite overcoming selective mutism, I still suffer from a certain level of anxiety in different situations. And this is common in a lot of sufferers of the condition. They will often never truly live without certain levels of anxiety because it is a mental health disorder and can actually come back later in life. SM can be caused by traumatic events in a person's life and if they encounter another traumatic event later on in life, it can trigger the condition again, leading to another uphill battle to recovery. I find myself now struggling with everyday life activities like answering the door, getting the bus and purchasing items from a shop, whereas social situations like meeting new people and social gatherings are a lot easier for me than they ever used to be. This is something I'm going to tackle and try to beat as I know it's definitely something that can be overcome with effort and persistence from my own thoughts. Although the condition is caused by environmental factors, it's also something that can be hereditary as I've already said. I didn't write that in there, but, and this is something I've discovered through talking to my dad about his childhood. Everything he explains about what he thought and felt in social situations completely linked in with my thoughts and feelings. The way he behaved in those situations was almost identical to the way I used to be. And it shows how this condition can be passed on in someone's genes and links to how it is referred to as a genetic predisposition. This is why it can be so difficult to cure a person with the condition because it's within their genes. However, it is certainly, um, achievable but just takes a long time. This leads to some adults still suffering from the condition and although um, this is rare, it is still possible to suffer from the condition throughout adulthood dependent on the circumstances. Selective mutism is mainly referred to as a childhood anxiety disorder because it's something that young children will commonly suffer from and they grow out of it. Unfortunately, when the condition is carried through into adulthood, it shows more difficult and underlying issues and can be incredibly difficult to treat. Overall, selective mutism has a huge impact on a person's life and can take away a massive section of their childhood that they'll never get back again. It creates bad memories and worries for the future, but with further education to teachers, students and parents about the condition, it can be tackled and treated correctly. The future will look brighter for anyone suffering from it because a wider understanding of mental health disorders will develop and people will, uh, will be able to help young children and adults suffering from the condition. Mental health disorders will be beaten. That is the end. My voice is dying. Okay, that was so long and my eyes are pain because look at look at all this. That, that, that is a lot of light and you probably can't even see. So that is my EPQ dissertation type weird thing that I did. Um, hopefully you 
you know, if you know your stuff about selective mutism, then correct me if I was wrong in any points. There was a few grammar errors in there, so, you know, maybe I might need to get my EPQ back and actually change that, because I've already handed it in. Um, but yeah, there's a few errors in there in terms of grammar, but basically that was my dissertation that I did and that's all based on research and my own experiences and I just wanted to write about it obviously with my EPQ I have all my planning my research um or like my links and everything like that is literally just the kind of final piece um that I'm reading today I, I do have like research and everything like that separate um but yeah hopefully you enjoyed kind of hearing that um, if you've got any questions then do leave them down below and if you suffered from it yourself then I would like to hear your story and kind of what you have to say. Um, so thanks for watching, give the video a thumbs up and subscribe because I will be doing some more videos based on selective mutism because obviously you know that's just what I like to talk about. Um, and I have previously done videos as well so if you want to check them out then please do. Um, but without further ado I'm gonna just say goodbye so thanks for watching and I'll see you in my next video hopefully um goodbye <laughs>